All this is Mubeen Sayed, Dr. Mubeen Sayed. Welcome to one more show. So this is a chit chat. I finally found the line that I was trying to show you. So here it is. So <clears throat> the incidence rates, this blue part, the incidence rates of COVID-19 cases for the week of September 11, 2021 are obtained from COVID net for all sex age and groups, sex, sex age groups. What I do not know is, did they take them all and then took the five to 11 years groups uh, data and then applied that or did they just use that blended model? I do not know that part. Okay, so. How is everyone? <laughs> so does Dr. Bean sound freaky or is it just me? Freaky in what sense? <laughs> Susan says, give us con. Uh, Eric Dog, hello, how are you? Nipa is here. Happy holidays. Happy Diwali. Um, okay, so I wanted to discuss something for the future talks to make them a little more, um, uh, more valuable. So how about if we, <laughs> Eric says, I tried to send Dr. Bean coffee, but my <laughs> Google won't let me sign in as a guest. So sorry about that. Uh, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Eric. So the, I wanted to make these parts of the talks, the chit chats more valuable. So how about if we, do chit chat every other day. And every day I post a community post under which you post your questions. And then what are, whatever are the most common questions, the first part of the chit chat, I answer those. Then we continue with our chit chat, but at least there will be some important questions that would have been answered as well. What do you think? If not, then that's okay. Second thing, um, on the on Dr. Bean's website, uh, I need to continue to offer some non-COVID discussions as well as I used to do before. So I'm gonna take one or two days every week to discuss something which is non-COVID. That may be cancer related, hypertension related, diabetes related, uh, microbiology, some topics that are necessary for medical students, nursing students, uh, healthcare professionals. So I hope that that is okay because uh, it's about one and a half year or more that I have been uh, you know, working more on the COVID side. So I think there needs to be a balance with the other talks as well. So Bubble Rapper says, would love that. Dr. Bean, thank you very much. Drew says that I really enjoyed the lecture with Dr. Priya Jay, very informative. Thank you very much. So Sergio says, can you explain poor Novavax efficacy in Hispanics? I cannot. And actually I've been trying to figure out the answer as well. Is it because the community that were vaccinated were less in number and it is because of that? Or was there some other reason? For example, vitamin Ds or the or comorbidities. I haven't seen that data yet. So it's a good question. Actually, I'm finding, uh, I'm searching for the result as well, or the reason as well. Doug, you did not miss a lot of chat. You just mid missed the first lecture. <laughs> so John Snyder says Diwali is not until November four. So yes. Yeah, so uh, my team, who are from India, they have taken off from tomorrow and they'll come back on Monday. So for me, it has started. <laughs> Ro Robin says, I liked your Halloween drawings. Thank you very much. 
So Gary has a very good question. Can vaccinated people spread COVID? Yes. And we have done this discussion before as well. Let me just very quickly draw this to explain it. So what happens is the following that let's say a person is fully vaccinated here and that fully vaccinated may be two weeks after a vaccine second dose or one week after according to the vaccination schedule so here is somebody who is fully vaccinated now when they're fully vaccinated for some time, for some months, their antibody formation would continue, correct? So let's say um, antibody levels were here. That's actually dose one, dose one, dose two. When the first dose is given, about a week later, antibodies would start getting formed. Then dose two will cause more number of cells and increase the levels and fully vaccination simply means that these are the levels that they think are protected so now here the dose 2 and fully vaccination has happened so here is the levels this is mostly IgG and with that there is going to be IgA as well there's going to be IgE as well mostly IgM is not present but can be present as well now this would continue for about six months, four months to six months, I would say. After that, the active cells that were act activated by vaccination, they would start dying, correct? So that is apoptosis or the cells are dying. And because of that, and some cells will become memory cells and they would say, hmm, I can remember things. And they would go and they will live either in the area for example if the vaccine is given in deltoid some of them would stay near deltoid others would go in the local lymph nodes and live there some of them would start circulating in this blood and then others would go and yet some others will go in the bone marrow and start living there too so these are the memory cells the remaining active cells would die apoptosis they'll kill themselves they said we don't want to continue working now, the question for somebody who is vaccinated and spreading has two parts to it. So actually three parts. First is this part between before the fully vaccination status. Of course, at this time, the, the um, antibodies levels are not that high that we can reliably say that a person would not spread. And for spreading, what is important is the following. So in the mouth and nose of the person or conjunctival areas, the, there need to be two things. Number one, number one, uh, immune cells. These cells could be cytotoxic T cells. These cells could be memory, uh, sorry, B cells. So that can be active. Of course, innate arm is always sitting there and is always active. I'm talking about the adaptive arm. The second part that is important, important is IgA, immunoglobulin A. So what happens is that when, when we start making antibodies, we start making with IgM. In case of COVID, we make IgM and IgG together. Then some cells do the class switching, which means they divide and the daughter cells that come together, they do not make IgG or IgM. They start making Ig. E or IgD or IgA. Um, and yes, for the medicos, IgD is formed in all cases because B cells use IgD as a receptor as well. So it is always formed. So IgA is formed as well. That IgA, let's say if this is that antibody IgA, two IgAs are joined together with something, a protein in the center that is called secretory protein that whole thing then this IgA two IgAs together are then put on the wet surfaces of our body now the function of these wet 
antibody, uh, sorry, not vent antibodies. Antibodies present in the wet surfaces is, for example, in the case of respiratory virus like SARS-CoV-2, that when SARS-CoV-2 enters our mouth, that what would it do? The antibodies will immediately coat it with the, so let's say this is SARS-CoV-2, and these antibodies were present, and the antibodies, let me make them red, I made them black here, but let's make them red. They would immediately start coating this SARS-CoV-2. The benefit of coating the surface of a pathogen is that number one, it hinders the pathogen from attaching to the cells. Number two, the antibodies, when they are coating a path pathogen, these antibodies would initiate something called complement cascade. Complement are proteins that will become active and they would make weapons against this pathogen and they would kill it. Plus complement would attract other cells in the local area as well and they would come and start fighting too. Then antibodies when they are attached or, or coating a pathogen, then that also allows the local dendritic cells and macrophages to bind more efficiently with these antibodies and pick them up or endocytose them or phagocytose them, eat them up and then destroy the antibody plus the pathogen. So that means what? That means if somebody is in this active state here, they may not even know that the virus arrived in their mouth or nose. And because of all the IgA present and because of all the cells present, they may not even shed a lot because as soon as the virus arrives, it is immediately coated and the, uh, the cells start attacking it and it's gone. Hopefully that is a normal in a healthy person. If they are not fully vaccinated, there is not enough level of IgA and cells there, then till the immune system responds and kills the virus, there could be virus load present that would cause shedding. Now, after this four to six months time, let's say four months, because books normally say four months, Let's say after four months, the antibodies have started waning. The cells have gone to apoptosis. Now the body is in a resting state. Immune system is in a resting state. In such state, when you expose the person again, then it takes anywhere from 10 hours to 48 hours. And everybody's, every person's immune system is different. So it could be even more variation from here. But it takes this much of time for the immune cells, these memory cells that are in the blood circulation, that are in the around the um, oropharyngeal areas, that are in the in the bone marrow, that are in the area where infection may have been, and these cells would start proliferating. Proliferating means they'll make more and more of the army. They'll make more daughter cells. They they'll make copies of themselves, and now we have many more soldiers, and they are ready to start attacking and functioning. This is called proliferation. And then they would differentiate as well. Differentiate means the new daughter cell need to know what am I fighting. And usually because they're coming from memory cells who already know how to fight with this particular pathogen, daughter cells would know how to fight with it as well. And they would start the fight. Now, till the time that they become ready and start fighting, the person may be shedding. It really depends how fast the immune system ramps up. It really depends how fast the IgA comes in, how fast the IgG comes in, how fast the CD8 T cells start attacking the system. Maybe that person's innate arm is generally very good. And even when the adaptive arm is sleeping, innate arm is attacking and taking care of the pathogen. But till the immune system takes care of this, the person may have enough viral load to develop symptoms and to start shedding. So to summarize my question, Gary, uh, my answer, can vaccinated people spread COVID? Yes, they can. The only thing is not everyone will spread COVID. It will depend what is the status of their immune system, what is the stage they are in, what is the level of antibodies, what is the level of active uh, immune cells. I think an in interesting question to attach to this is, if they shed, how long will they shed? So again, assuming a healthy person, because folks who unfortunately, let's say, have cancers or are under immunosuppression 
suppressive therapies or have uncontrolled diabetes. And uncontrolled diabetes also means immunosuppression because their immune cells are not functioning correctly because they do not have glucose available to them or leukemia patients and so on. Such patients may not respond in a healthy way to the virus. So here what I'm talking about is the virus and the response in a healthy way. So now the question will be how long? So if a person was previously infected and recovered or vaccinated, then usually we should expect two, three days. Again, if the person is in this state, if they are here, then they would not even know that I had the virus and they might just immediately attack the virus because everything is active and they're done. Here, the person may shed for two, day, two days or three days. Compare this to somebody who is getting infected for the first time or getting vaccinated for the first time that is here. They might shed for a longer period of time. So I hope this answers all aspects of the <laughs> question. Okay, so <clears throat> Doug Paul says, uh, Dr. Bean, binge watching your older immunology lectures. Thank you very much. And isn't this interesting? The lectures are old. I was young. So sometimes I look at them and I crack up. I was so very first immunology lecture. I think it is 2011. I was in Massachusetts. We had bought a condo. I had recently moved in there. And that lecture I was doing in the garage of the condo. And I remember in Massachusetts, East Coast, there are, of course, lots of snow and cold. So in the winter time, it would become so cold in that garage that I would not be able to, you know, um, teach correctly. So I used to have a little heater nearby and I'll go run to it and I'll warm my hands and then come back and start teaching. So these, these lectures are old and have a lot of uh, fun memories. Erica says, question, shedding in car with windows shut as opposed to shedding in shop, greater concentration, no? So yes, so if you have a, there are so many factors in there, but generally you are correct. A shop has a larger volume of air and so would dissipate the virus more. But still, I think there are other factors. For example, uh, if the car's AC is running, AC is interesting, they can help and hurt both. If AC and the filters are clean, they may help clean out, but normally cars, cars, filters are not that sophisticated, most of the cars. AC can hurt as well because the pathogens can get stuck to the, to the vents and then they can become recirculating. At the same time, the humidity, the temperature inside the car, uh, the uh, level of uh, you know stickiness in the environment where can pathogen be attached all of those would matter but yes car is a more smaller environment so it can get filled more uh, faster if the windows are closed the the ac is not recycling outside uh, air compared to a shop now a shop as well for example there was a study that said in a doctor's uh, clinic imagine that is a shop in doctor's clinic, if somebody is exposed for 15 minutes to someone who had the COVID, then there is a chance that they would get infected as well. Mark, so Carlos says for the clotting issue. So I was, okay, so oh, every time I try to click it. So Mark Gerber says, does vaccine impact, impair original immune functioning? No. So this is an incorrect um, thought that has been propagated in the system, system meaning our social <laughs> discussion and discourse. Here is uh, an important thing to note. Let's say here we have a vaccine. 
some vaccine, right? Vaccine comes in, what would happen is our macrophages or dendritic cell will pick it up. They will present it on their surface and they'll go everywhere and say, hey, you see other cells, mostly the T cells. They say, can you see what I got here? And the T cell, <laughs> this is my impression of a macrophage. So macrophage would say, hey, I got this. And then the T cell, the naive T cell would connect here if it is interested in this. And by interested, what I mean is that if it can connect with that antigen little um, piece of that, and if it can connect and if it can work with it, then it would start, either it will become T helper two or T helper one. We've done that discussion in the past. Then the plasma cell would become active. And so we'll have either the antibodies, the chemical weapons, or we'll have CD8 positive T cells, which are the soldiers who are going to fight or karate masters or ninjas who are going to fight, you know, hand to hand. So this is the basic discussion. Now imagine when the vaccine comes in and it activates these cells. What happens is when these cells are activated or, or they, are, um, they start functioning against this uh, antigen, then there are memory cells formed from them. So in the future, when the same infection arrives again, then the immune system doesn't have to go through this whole lazy pathway. This lazy pathway has two pieces, right? So this is the innate arm. Innate arm immediately starts attacking. So about 10 hours or so, innate arm starts working. But sometimes even faster than that, depends upon where the infection occurred. The adaptive arm is kind of lazy. The first time it needs to look at the pathogen and it needs to look at the pieces of the antigen and, and see what cell can kill them and what would kill them. So it takes five days to 14 days, in some cases, even 29 days. Then they become active. So in this time, the virus can cause a lot of damage. So the body has learned to make copies of these cells and keep them as memory. So when the, in the future, the exposure occurs again, instead of going through this whole lazy pathway, now they just activate the immune system copies, the memory cells, and they would start attacking within 10 hours to 24 hours, 48 hours. Now, the concept of um, vaccine somehow blocking or impairing or disabling or uh, weakening the original immune response is not possible. Here is why. Let's say we give the vaccine and these memory cells are made. Now let's say the actual infection appears again. And these are normal mechanism, meaning there is no magic here. It's not that there is something magical that some someone else knows and the other immunology people don't know or the books do not know. So now let's say in the future, the infection comes back. When the infection appears again, when the exposure appears again, what happens is the innate arm, as usual, will become, you know, active. When it will become active, it will break down the pathogen once again. Now that pathogen, remember this macrophage or the dendritic cell, it runs around everywhere in the body and present it to everyone and say, imagine if I hold a tiny bit of a pathogen. So here, and I go around everyone. Imagine we were all sitting together and I go and touch everyone and say, do you like this? Do you like this? <laughs> so I think you're going to punch me. But anyways, th that is the point. So the macrophage goes everywhere in the body and say, do you, do you like this? Do you like this? And in that process, it goes to lymph nodes where the memory cells are sitting. And when it touches them as well, I say, do you like this? They say, yeah, yeah, sure. I like, I love this. And they wake up and they start making antibodies or they start doing CD8 function or cytotoxic function. That is how uh, the vaccines generally work. So because of that, there is no concept really of vaccine weakening the other parts of the immune system. There is one way that a vaccine can actually attack an immune system where you give the vaccine that trains the immune system to attack the immune system. But that's, of course, would be a poison. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Augie says, so good questions coming in today. 
have swollen lymph nodes that swell and retract over six months been reported post COVID vax or post infection? Um, <clears throat> the reason for the lymph nodes to swell up and then go back and then swell up usually is because they get inflammatory messages. So what does that mean? If I, let's say here is a lymph node, right? So lymph node has a bunch of incoming uh, channels. So let's say this is a, this is a lymphatic channel. And these are, this is a venous channel and there is a arterial. It's not just one, there are many, but I just made one for representation. So here what happens is that when the um, antigen is brought in, so let's say a dendritic cell comes running in and says, look guys, what I got, look at this, or a macrophage comes in, or some neutrophil over here picked up something, they picked up some antigen or they picked up some bad cell and they broke it up, a natural killer cell did that. that and that debris was floating in this lymph and reached here. So meaning something reached the lymph node, that something can be broken pieces of antigen from outside of the lymph node. So that means, for example, let's say from throat or some other pieces where, which are infected, or the immune cells bringing in the captured pathogens from outside, or it could be the cytokine that are being produced without regard to what is happening. So there may not be a pathogen that is autoimmunity, correct? There may not be pathogen, but there is some cell that is going totally nuts and saying, what the heck, I'm make, going to make cytokines. And that causes production of the antibodies or other cells activation. Eventually, there need to be cytokine or cells which would cause these cells that live in the immune system, the lymph node, these cytokines are going to activate these cells. And when these cells are activated, they make their copies. And when they make their copies, that would cause the lymph node to swell up and become tender and, and painful. Then at some point, this would go away because we have T regulatory cells, T reg cells or T helper 17 cells. Their function is to say, calm down, everyone. Stop. What the heck are you guys doing? Don't do this fight. Just calm down. And that would cause some of these cells to do apoptosis and the other cells do not release cytokines and the whole thing would calm down and the lymph node would try to go back to normal. If this keeps happening again and again, eventually the lymph node will get damaged and become cal calcified. So now going back to your question, has there been lymph nodes in a cyclical way every six months swelling and then going back? That could be a reason that there is an exposure. That could be a long COVID as well, where the inflammatory system keeps working in a low threshold and every time it cycles that causes the lymph node inflammation this is in the context of covid but if somebody continues to have lymph node issues anytime when you get the inflammation go to the doctor so that if they wanted to understand more they wanted to see your markers or maybe they wanted to do a biopsy if they suspect something other than this then they can do it but this is a possibility with covid Okay, so more question. So Carlos Ortiz says, I was looking at Novavax trial video you made, and sadly it seems that there is a higher occurrence of cerebrovascular accidents. It seems to happen with other vax as well. Do you know why? So CVAs or cerebrovascular accidents, again, there are many theories for why it happens. I feel bad that there is a continuous theory that is pushed that these things happen because of the incorrect um, injection. Maybe that is a reason as well, but that changes 
the perspective from hey vaccine companies what's wrong with your vaccine why is it doing this to hey healthcare worker why are you not injecting without aspiration so healthcare workers you can ask them to aspirate and then do it but you can see there are so many people who are getting these issues so why the cerebrovascular accidents are occurring there could be thrombosis and that is related to clotting and i have done detailed discussions for how clotting occurs one of the just a couple of reasons what happens is let's say this is a blood vessel and inside the blood vessel we have endothelium endothelium is the surface inner surface of the blood vessel right now vaccine or covid let's say vaccine if we have um so i'm going to talk about the the um theory for clotting and this is a theory that was originated in in uh, from german and i think it has actually uh, been proven that that is what it is but let's treat it as a theory their theory was that let's say here is here is the vaccine i'm going to make or vaccine generated antigen that may be um, adenovirus mostly clotting is occurring because of the adenoviruses so this is the adenovirus right so adenovirus has the dna in it as well plus adenovirus itself is a virus too so what happens is there there is some immune response either to the adenovirus or when the adenovirus goes into our cell and then our cell makes let's say this is inside the cell and the cell makes the spike proteins and the spike protein pieces are then presented on the surface and then those pieces cause molecular mimicry and molecular mimicry is that a part of the antigen that came in to our system or was broken up and those smaller pieces are seen some piece starts looking like something of our body's tissue and we have done this discussion many times that the uh, body breaks up the antigens into very smaller pieces anywhere from 7 amino acid long to 11 or 23 base depending upon which cell is involved and so when our body gets trained to attack something similar smaller 6 7 amino acid it may attack those antibodies that are created to attack this pattern so let's say the antigen here the pattern is this i'm just making up this not messenger rna let me change the pattern so let's say the this is the pattern and the body learns to attack this right so this is an antibody and the antibody learns to attack this pattern now this antibody if it finds other tissues normal tissues of our body which have the same pattern then this antibody can attack them as well that is called molecular mimicry now inside the blood vessels are platelets platelets normally release platelet factor 4 around them so if this is a platelet usually near the platelet are floating imagine a big big ship floating in the blood system and then tiny ships are floating near it or th- tiny fish are floating with it so these tiny fish are platelet factor 4 platelet factor 4 this platelet factor 4 becomes the target of these antibodies that were actually against part of the vaccine and this is how virus can do this as well so once the antibody binds antibody that was created by the vaccine or for the vaccine when it binds to the platelet factor 4 this complex because it is floating near the platelet it actually just stumbles on or tumbles on and gravitates to the platelet itself and just binds there this causes activation of platelet when you do this to platelet platelet says oh you asked me to become active all right i'll become active and as soon as the platelet becomes active what it would do is it would start hugging the other platelets nearby and they would start clotting now this clotting or this little clot or microembolus can go to the brain vessels as well and cause cerebrovascular accidents that is one theory other theory 
is if we take Dr. Bruce Patterson's um, discussion that monocytes at the boundaries of the blood vessels have picked up S1 parts of the spike protein and they are holding onto it and they are irritated and they keep releasing cytokines. Now those cytokines can cause inflammation in the blood vessels and if there are small blood vessels in the brain which are inflamed that they can cause obstruction of the blood supply because they're too tiny and they get swollen as well and they close and that can cause a CVA. Then there is another uh, theory for the long hauls and that is that the blood cell morphology changes, the blood cell shapes change. I've done that uh, study as well. So imagine the RBC shapes are changing and what happens is normally, let's say this is a capillary. Normally RBC are a little bigger than the capillary. For example, RBC is eight micrometer and the capillary is five micrometer in diameter. The RBC has to squeeze through this to pass from it. And it, during this process of squeezing and passing through this tube capillary, the pressure behind the RBC develops that helps maintain blood pressure. Plus when the, when the RBC is, let's say, it reaches here and it is really stuck in this little uh, uh, capillary and it is slowly moving and there is pressure from the heart to pump more blood that causes enough pressure that some nutritional substances are squeezed out. So uh, RBC helps produce pressure in the capillary as well. Now imagine the RBC's shape is deformed. So RBC comes in here, arrives near the, the capillary and then gets stuck on the mouth of it and that would cause RBC not to be able to move through the capillary because it is all crotchety and and, and sticky and, and hard and um, stiff and that would cause blood vessel blockade as well. That would also cause clotting and that can cause CVS too. So there can be many reasons for CVS related to COVID or the vaccine. Correct. So, Robin, they call it a Z-roll. So, yeah, there is a Z-rolling that is done. So, how do you do says, average days until COVID symptoms is five days. Okay. Average viral reduction is lower after seven days when vaccine versus unvaccinated. Unvaccinated will stay at home when you get symptom. Solidarity is not just, sorry, I, I didn't catch the question, uh, Howdy. Um, Shani J says, is there a pre-vax protocol? So I'll tell you what I did. So of course I cannot give an advice and I cannot uh, offer uh, medical uh, advice to anyone. So what I had done was, I wanted to make sure that during the vaccination, I have lesser chance of clotting and I have lesser chance of um, antibody uh, reactions, including myocarditis. Although people in my age are at lesser risk, it is mostly boys under 30 years of age, but still. So these were the two primary things that I wanted to make sure that I am handling. And the third thing, unknowingly, I did not know that there is a possibility of S1 component to be sticking out in the monocyte and living longer and may cause injury. But I generally had IVM as well. So what I did was I took anti uh, over-the-counter blood thinners. I took anti-inflammatories plus IVM, which was not over-the-counter. And that is what I did for uh, other family members as well. Interestingly, I navigated okay, so maybe it was the protocol or not, but I navigated okay. My wife developed side effects, which continued on for five, six months, but she did not develop those severe side effects. She had um, uh, Johnson & Johnson. One of my sons had Pfizer, one had Moderna, I have Moderna. So that is how I did for the most part. So when you are talking with your doctors, the discussion to have is that, hey, 
what anti uh, what blood thinners or anti clotting i mean it's not blood thinners seems but aspirin like things what blood thinners what anti inflammatory what kind of uh, immune system regulator can i take um connie white again i cannot give you a straight medical advice that's just not right uh, but you're you're on day eight of COVID and you are here and you're talking, so hopefully you are doing fine. Most of the patients, when they reach this kind of a day and they are generally doing okay and they are talking and chatting, and then mostly um, they are okay as well. But really, it depends upon the the oxygen saturation, the person's comorbidities, person's health, their nutritional status, and so on. So. Um, I'm just assuming that you are <laughs> sitting here talking with us. So good luck, and I'm sure that you will be fine. I'm praying for that, and stay in touch with your doctor as well. <laughs> Starfire says, I'm just here for the mewing cats. Thank you. Uh, so Luffy had gone out, and I think it was cold. So when he comes back from outside and it is cold, then he just goes somewhere warm and sleeps. Um, Susan says that aren't newly formed platelets usually bigger than the older ones? Um, no, so platelets generally do not shed their membranes to, to shrink down. Although you could say this, that the megakaryocyte, the bigger the platelet's father or mother or the parent platelet, when that megakaryocyte cell is formed, it's so big that it is trapped inside the jail of the uh, my, uh, the fenestrations or uh, what do we call them in the bone marrow the sinuses it is trapped there and then pieces of that just fly off and those tiny pieces that fly off are platelets so if you refer to this and yeah we have a big parent platelet parent cell mega karyocyte we call it mega because it is big karyocyte so that then gives rise to these tiny platelets Frisco Coupon says, could any of the following at the time of infection have a role in long COVID? Mitochondria health, mitochondria health, very important role because if the inflammatory system becomes dysregulated, then there is a problem for oxidation. Nitric oxide, yes. Metformin, no. Low carb diet, no. I mean, it is good to have low carb diet because one, there is less disregulation of uh, glucose, and secondly, low carb diet is less inflammatory. So generally, inflammation levels are lower. Metabolic syndromes depend upon what is that syndrome. So we're talking COVID, long COVID. We still do not know exactly what happens in the long COVID, and why does it happen in some people and not others. So because we don't know the basic problem, we know the outcomes. Because of that, it's difficult to connect these levers. So Augie says, any significant news from Patterson? I'm hearing many are relapsing. Actually, what I have seen is sometimes people relapse if they do not take medicine for long enough, a couple of months. And secondly, I've seen if during the therapy, they become active when they are actually feeling better. So what I've seen is that if they keep the activity level at a lower level, and if they continue with the therapy for a reasonable amount of time, they usually do not relapse. Carlos Ortiz says, thank you for your thorough explanation. You are very welcome. So Stephanie, this is totally fine. The, this particular study, I did that about a year ago. And you are correct in saying the BNT162, B2 mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 reprograms both adaptive and immune response. The um, good and bad of this message is the following. 
good is that this is actually a mechanism for everything. Every pathogen does it. And I'll explain that in a second. The bad is that it was presented as if it is only with the vaccine. And then many people latched onto it and they thought, hey, look, here is a, um, here is a uh, proof that innate arm gets affected. So let me just very quickly explain what does this mean. The, and this, I had actually done this study far before. Unfortunately, what happens is that when I explain the mechanism, which are actually confirmable, verifiable from medicine books, still the anger is taken out on me to somehow I am the one who is making up these wrong mechanisms. But these are not wrong mechanisms. These are normal immunology mechanisms. So here is the innate arm and here is the adaptive arm. Innate arm has cells, for example, macrophages, dendritic cells, <laughs> make dendritic cells like this, natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are interesting. They are actually lymphocytes. That means they belong to adaptive arm, but they broke ranks from there and they came and joined the innate arm and said, hey, guys, I'm going to fight with you guys. And then there are complement proteins and there are other cells as well. But let's use that. In the adaptive arm, we have naive T cells, naive T cells, we have T helper 1, T helper 2. So T helper 1 and 2 are really just the um, naive T cell becoming T helper 1 or 2. Then B cells that become active and are called plasma cells. And then cytotoxic T cell or CD8, 8 cells. Now, looking at the reprogramming part, when it a pathogen arrives in our body. It is always the innate system that defends first. Innate system is more immediate, but less specific. What does that mean? For example, our skin is part of the innate arm. Our skin doesn't know that it is coming in contact with skin or a pathogen or a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or a food particle or something else. It just protects us. It is a layer through which things do not pass, mostly, you can rub them and some of that will be absorbed, but mostly they do not pass. And so this is a protection and we call it non-specific protection or innate arm. Similarly, these cells over here, these cells are non-specific. When a pathogen arrives, pathogen arrives in a body, a virus or fungus or bacteria or, or some worm or something, what they do is they have pattern matching little tentacles on them and they kind of, you know, put their hands on these pathogens. And if they find some patterns that they think are odd, they would attack it. So that is how the innate arm attacks the pathogens. Then the innate arm activates the adaptive arm, which we have talked even today and have talked in the past discussions too. And then adaptive arm is more specific. What does that mean? What that means is that adaptive arm actually looks at, so let's say this is spike protein. Adaptive arm will look at binding to this spike protein specifically and create cells that know how to attack this, this antigen. We call it specificity. Now, as part of the specificity, adaptive arm, when it works, it also makes memory cells for future usage. I discussed that in a few minutes ago, right? A few minutes ago. So this is adaptive. We uh, doctors and scientists have always wanted that, hey, isn't this possible that innate arm somehow learned as well? And somehow innate arm became more sharp about, let's say, SARS-CoV-2 or some other pathogen. This behavior of the cells here, becoming memory cells from active cells, is a kind of a reprogramming of the system where you take a cell and you say, okay, guy, you have become now active cell. You know how to attack this. Now go to sleep. It's trained and it has gone to sleep. We don't have any such memory cell behavior on the innate arm. But 
whenever and and this is a newer discovery not newer like this year or last year for i think it was discovered somewhere in 2005 or 6 time frame meaning in last couple of decades this was found out as far as i know we found out or the immunologists found out or the research workers found out that when innate arm cells are exposed to an antigen they can actually change their genes and this is where people become all upset but here is the deal look this b cell when it becomes active the first time active b cell if i make that here this b cell the first time when it starts working it is called plasma cell it normally makes igd and igm then it changes its genes which is called class switching it changes the gene genetic material it switches from one class of d and m to igd continues to be formed and now instead of m it makes igg this is actually a genetic change in the system it opens up a different page on its genes to say now i'm not going to make m anymore i'm going to make g then another daughter of this may open up the genes to start making e ige or then another iga this is reprogramming happening this is cells ge- genetic system changing and our genetic system is expressing all the time we are making enzymes and we are making proteins how are they made because our immune system sorry immune system our dna changes its gene expressions and based on what genes are being expressed the cell does some something specific now these cells also have further genetic changes that they become memory cell correct so this all is called reprogramming but mostly on the adaptive side we just call them memory cell formation or class switching on the innate side we do not have any such term so what we do is that when these cells let's say this is a macrophage when you ex- expose that macrophage to a sars cov 2 macrophage would learn it is a good thing it would learn how to attack this this um, sars cov 2 in the future it is kind of a memory which is weird which is very interesting it was not we did not know these things couple of decades ago we knew memory cells were present in adaptive we did not know memory was present in innate so there is no memory we call it cross training or reprogramming that is a term given reprogramming means we programming if i know the spelling that will be awesome so reprogramming means that the macrophages learn how to attack sars cov 2 and they how do they learn they cannot become memory cells so they learn to keep which gene i should keep open and attack it that is such a fascinating thing that means when you get an infection from common cold your respiratory system macrophages will remember by opening a set of genes forever to say next time the respiratory infection occurred this pathogen came in i'm going to attack it this way then let's say some other pathogen comes in the same macrophage now attacking this one would also make another change and it would now learn to become better at fighting with this one and not only this much macrophages normally eat about 100 to 110 things and then they die so if they die the learning dies with them the reprogramming dies with them so some macrophages can actually go back into the areas to rest and they carry that little reprogram with them so in the future they can attack the pathogen more efficiently that is what a vaccine based reprogramming means infection does that too vaccine should do that too any other antigen that would come in would interact with macrophage or dendritic cell and will cause reprogramming this is why we say that children handle sars cov 2 better because number one their ace2 is less in the respiratory system and number 2 we say their innate arm for the respiratory system is cross trained it is reprogrammed because they get exposed to so many infections respiratory infections they get 
common colds from one to the other in the schools or, or the daycares. Every one child becomes sick and everybody becomes sick. So they are so much exposed that their, their respiratory system immune cells clusters are kind of reprogrammed and cross-trained and active. And that is another factor that they handle COVID better. So uh, Stephanie, uh, I hope this was a useful discussion. Reprogramming is a term that was used. It is a correct, correct immunology term, which says learning of the innate arm. Okay, so <laughs> Eugene, you, Eugenie Breda says, smash the like. Yes, smash the like button. Okay, so so <laughs> Howdy Rowdy says, part one, I am 22. So please don't give too much information. Healthy, good. Med student, awesome. Advocating vaccines, good. But I can't get my head around the following. People keep saying, you have to vaccinate, vaccinate yourself to keep others safe. And your question part two. But the average time to get symptoms is five days. The viral load is reduced after seven days with the vaccine. Uh, you get symptoms before the viral load would be lowered with the vaccine, you stay at home. So there is a slight... Uh, then you have a part three as well. So there is a slight um, uh, correction that needs to be done to this mechanism. And I'm talking to a medical student now, so uh, I'm not talking vaccine or anything. Let's just talk uh, uh, the mechanisms, immunology mechanisms. So here, first of all, let's leave. You have to vaccinate yourself to keep others safe. Let's leave that for a second. Let's look at this part. Average time to get symptoms is five days. That was the case with the original Wuhan uh, variant. Nowadays, with Delta, the average time has shrunk. But I understand what you're saying in principle, that it's not that if I get exposed now, I get the symptoms right away. It takes some time. Okay. Uh, viral load. So let me draw this as well. So you're saying exposure occurred here, here. You're saying average time for the symptoms is five days. And I would change this in a second. Viral load is reduced after seven days. So here is the seven days. And you're saying viral load would first increase and then reduce. And you get symptoms before the viral load would be lowered with the vaccine. Yes, you. So you get symptoms usually two days before you start getting the symptoms. Um, would be lowered with the vaccine equals you stay at home. Okay, so I didn't get the last part, but let me just correct something here. If this is, if you're talking about a person fully vaccinated or had infection before and has developed the whole response to it and then recovered, then when the exposure occurs here, when the exposure occurs again, so this is a person, let's say, fully vaccinated, you know, two doses and two weeks after the two doses. Or this is a person who just got infected and then about a month after. When the exposure occurs again, it will not now take five days. I just explained that a few minutes ago. Now it will be if the body is in active state. Where did I make that one? If the body is in that active state, I made that here. If the body is in this state, then the viral load probably would not even get to a point of creating symptoms because body is already equipped and just would attack it. If the body is in this state, then the viral load would start increasing as soon as the delta comes in, it, it starts replicating. But within 10 hours to 48 hours, whatever the viral load has become till that time, the body would attack it and start reducing the viral load from there and take care of it. In that process, there could be shedding and there could be symptoms as well. Now, if I can just comment on this to say, take vaccine to save others. A vaccinated person during this active four months, it is true that they would shed less. Over here, they may shed equal 
to an unvaccinated person or an infected and recovered person who is six months away, this load may be same, but for a shorter number of days because body's immune system, you're a medical student, immune system would now get up and start working within 10 hours to 48 hours and start taking care of the virus. So load would not continue to go up for five days and then go down after seven days. That happens if somebody is naive for the infection, that is, it is occurring for the first time, then the virus load would continue to increase as the, as the adaptive arm is getting ready and it can take up to five days. That is a mean time. In some people, it could be faster. In some people, it could be later. Mean time is 5.1 days for SARS-CoV-2. And then as the immune system would now start attacking it, about seven days, eight days, it starts coming down. But that again is a mean time because there has been studies which showed, and I discussed those studies last year, that there was a person whose viral load stayed up till 29 days and she was healthy. She was young woman, healthy, but her viral load stayed up higher for 29 days. She was known as an outlier because not everybody does that. So seven days is not a hard and fast thing. It's just that whenever your immune system can start chipping away and reducing the virus, it would start reducing the load. So that is the second part. I saw a third part as well. I didn't understand the, sec the last sentence here, so my apologies for that. Then you say third part, if it doesn't reduce the average time when sy symptoms first appear, why would an unvaxxed person endanger people more than a vax person because you want to stay home earlier due to your symptoms? So if I try to understand what you're saying is, there is a difference. I, I explained that here as well. And this is not a... So what I feel bad about these discussions is that some people take become the group of I am pro-vax and I am vaccinated and I'm going to now shame someone who's not vaccinated. Somebody who's not vaccinated, then they become upset as well and they become a group and they say, I'm going to attack everyone who is vaccinated and it just becomes a fight. What we should do is we are vaccinated or we are unvaccinated. We want a vaccine. We do not want a vaccine for whatever reason. We should know the mechanisms correctly so that when we are discussing it, we don't look like we do not know what we are saying or we don't have to resort to attacking others. So here, the this part, if it doesn't reduce the average time when symptoms first appear, so here, let's say, I'm not going to say unvaccinated. I'm going to say um, infection naive, SARS-CoV-2 naive. That is a term they use in literature when they're trying to be a little more decent. Um, and let's say here is a person who is vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Here is a person who is SARS-CoV-2 naive. This is vax. Expose them both here. This is just experimental discussion. I'm not asking for anyone to be exposed. Based on what is the status of the immune system for the person who had the vaccination or had the infection and recovered, they may not even develop enough load to have symptoms. Or if they do, this might only be for a couple of days and then the immune system would take care of it and gone. This person, mean time, it used to be five days. Now it is two to three days that they can develop symptoms because Delta propagates fast. And before that, they could be actually shedding, but the symptoms are still not there. It's shedding simply means that the virus is present in the mouth and the talk or laugh or breathe and they can throw the virus out. Then adaptive arm will take 5.1 days or seven days. Mean is usually five, but it can even take up to 14 days. Till that time that adaptive arm becomes ready, this person would continue to shed. Innate arm can do whatever it is and try to control it. If the person doesn't have cross training from other respiratory infections as well, it is not going to really take care of it. And so they are shedding. Then the adaptive arm has ramped up and the antibodies have started appearing. And now they're going to bring the, the virus viral load down in a healthy, normal individual, healthy individual. Everybody is normal. So this would happen for a longer period of time. That's all. Now, 
saving others, not saving others, or staying home or not staying home. These are all different discussions. This is the mechanism. By the way, howdy, rowdy, what year are you in? When are you graduating? <laughs> Eric Dog, I like your comments. So a vax person can be exposed, not get symptoms and shed virus and infect someone. Uh, this actually, you know that um, a majority, a lot of people who are even not vaccinated can get asymptomatic infection and be spreaders. Children can be super spreaders as well. Some people actually, adults are super spreaders. So in general, anybody who got the virus did not develop a symptom, will not know that I have the virus and they may be shedding and they would spread it. That can be an unvaccinated person or a vaccinated person or an immunocompromised with vaccination and so on. There are many, many scenarios. Johnny V, this is a very interesting question. You were showing us via a drawing how a small blood vessel could be blocked. Is it possible that one of the vaccines or a strain of this virus could cause a spontaneous coronary artery? No. The <laughs> Let me back up with my no. Usually, the coronary arteries, if they're blocked, more already blocked, more than 80-85%, that is called clinical horizon. And after that, the person would start getting chest pain and so on. Capillaries are about 5 micrometer in size, very tiny. Coronary arteries are big arteries compared to capillaries. So for a vaccine to do this, now if, God forbid, a, cap a coronary artery was already blocked or almost getting blocked and you added inflammation to that artery, that may actually then cause a blockage. But the vaccine or the virus, they're too tiny to be able to do this. So, Frisco, this is a very good question. You should get a trophy for this question. You said reprogramming of macrophages is important for fighting infections. So, how do kids exposed to a lot of lot at school compared to adults exposed a lot working on medical? So, they are same. This is why uh, sometimes it is thought that healthcare workers that are exposed to continuous dose of some pathogen may develop immunity. So that cross reaction can occur. So yeah, you're correct. Johnny V says, thank you for your help. You're very welcome. Um, that's a very interesting question, Rima. Any known links between vaccination, cortisone shots and stroke within a week? So we know that within a week, Remember with the vaccines, when the clotting issues started coming in, then there was a continuous discussion that, hey, somebody who got vaccinated and within four or five days, three days to five days. And for us cool beans, we are more mechanism oriented. So instead of just remembering the days, it's really everybody's immune system responds with different speeds. And so in some people, it may be three days. In some people, it may be seven days. So days are not important, but these are general ideas that, hey, keep an eye on this type of day. So I would say that after two, three days, two, even one, two weeks, it is possible that clotting can occur. And the signs of clotting are persistent headache, persistent tummy ache, persistent muscle aches, leg aches, difficulty in breathing, uh, bruising on the skin, and so on. So there could be joint pains, but persistent. They don't go away. Now, after vaccine, some people actually develop headaches for a couple of days. That is usually not an indication of the uh, clotting. Clotting headache usually starts after two, three days and then continues for 
it just persists for a longer period of time and it's a bad headache. This is generally from these studies. <laughs> Gift. Give 24 GT says, we are the beans of mechanisms. Yes, organic mechanisms, correct. Very interesting. So Diana Walton says, I'm a respiratory therapist and my COVID symptoms feel just like they did in December 2019 when I was sick. So w was it too bad or mild or because you're a respiratory therapist, do you get more exposed to patients and Carlos, that is a very good question. I know that it is mostly for women under 50. Um, I haven't seen the data for men. So this is a good question and I do not know the answer. Sean J. Um, Shawnee, does the new Pfizer antiviral uh, is that the molnupiravir we're talking about? That That is Pfizer or is that Merck? Um, I forgot whose is molnupiravir. Um, I think molnupiravir is Merck, right? Merck, molnupiravir, yeah. Pfizer's pill is, they, but that is also an, um, um, what is that? Nucleoside analog. So if I said Pfizer COVID pill, into top, what was the Pfizer? I think new pill to prevent. Pfizer's new pill to prevent COVID is not the same as Avermectin. That is fine. Uh, <clears throat> what is the name oh come on stop <laughs> so oral antiviral pf this so this is the i think it is a what's the mechanism protease inhibitor so the drug being studied by pfizer acts as a protease inhibitor which prevents a virus from replicating so if i quickly go in here so <clears throat> Let's say here is a cell, and this cell is infected by SARS-CoV-2, right? So we have SARS-CoV-2 here, or the messenger RNA from SARS-CoV-2, mRNA. This mRNA will work with the ribosome, and this is a, a medical student here. I'm happy that you're here. Positive sense um, mRNA. Positive sense mRNAs mean that they can directly attach to ribosome without any change in them. And they can start translating right away. They can start making proteins right away. So now, Shani, for you, when the ribosome is attached here and the ribosome starts helping make the proteins, the, the SARS-CoV-2 protein will be like this big protein blob. We call it a big mega protein or big protein. So if I show animal cutout stickers or something, <laughs> sorry for this. If I go to images, please don't mind if these are. So you may have seen these, uh, these sticker sheets where there are animals and you can peel them off and these are individual things and you can then stick them on your computer and the other places, correct? Uh, I'm sure that you've seen them. For example, whoa, sorry. So back here, <clears throat> a big, big protein is made, which has tiny proteins stuck in it. The, there are two important proteins that are stuck that are important. One of them is RDRP of the virus. And the other one is um, three chymotrypsin-like protease. Sorry. The other one is three chymotrypsin like protease. So M, M pro, we call it M pro or three CTL. This protein, protease, as the name says, it is, it breaks the proteins. So what this do is imagine in this 
sheet. It, it is so funny. I, I enjoy it so much when I discuss this. Imagine this animal cutout sheet. Uh, let's take this one. So imagine these are all stickers, but one of the stickers is a monster. And when you take that monster out, it then eats up the remaining sheet and frees the remaining monsters. So same way that three chymotrypsin-like protease, it self-detaches automatically and then starts gnawing away at the remaining big protein blob and free the other enzymes. It's very smart, right? And so these two things, RDRP and three chymotrypsin-like protease, are viral proteins that help the virus start with their um, break down the enzymes, free them up, and then they would start wreaking havoc in the system, in the cell. Pfizer's pill is 3-chymotrypsin-like protease inhibitor. So it would inhibit this part from detaching and activating. So the virus will come in, it will make its bigger protein, but if Pfizer's pill is present here, it's going to block this protease from doing its function and liberating the other enzymes, and the virus replication will stop here. So that is how it would stall new virus formation. Now, three chymotrypsin-like protease inhibitors, there are many other protease inhibitors as well that can do this. But this is their uh, mechanism. So from an IVM point of view, IVM also has three chymotrypsin-like protease inhibitor function. It also disrupts RDRP as well. So in that way, you could say there is similarity. But generally, the Pfizer's vaccine is only three chymotrypsin-like protease inhibitor. So string loop says mRNA vaccine has to be stored at lower temperature because mRNA is not stable molecule. Why are we not using alternate solutions? I can see the refrigeration. So I agree with you that traditional vaccines should also be uh, promoted and used. Uh, so I'm with you. I like mRNA vaccines too, but you are correct in terms of their storage issues. So Diane says, if in theory, if we had a way of contacting the common cold, that would prevent one from contacting, contracting COVID-19. Not exactly. However, there has been a study that I discussed a few days ago where the researchers said that those individuals who had previous human coronavirus-based common cold and then they got sick with SARS-CoV-2, their symptoms were milder compared to others who did not have recent common cold with human coronaviruses. So that was a very interesting um, point of view. I actually thought at that time that, hey, maybe one of the solution is to have human coronavirus as an antigen and maybe introduce that without any adjuvants because what would a human coronavirus do? But anyways, this is not a, I'm just thinking aloud in terms of mechanisms. <laughs> Susan says that's a busy donut. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's make it a better donut and let's then. So I think I have really, really. Um, let's do this. If I make it smaller, then I can quickly fill it. This software doesn't have uh, fill. So we've done this. And now, how about this? And then let's put some sprinkles on it. <laughs> there, there you are. There you are. I love drawing. So one thing that I really am grateful to all cool beans is giving me giving me a possibility of drawing for last 18 months. Although my both arms paid the price and I have numb things on my hands, but I still really enjoyed um, enjoyed making these diagrams. 
And so if I can now give tiny bit of shade to these as well. I know you're going to be now cursing me that what the heck is he doing? It's all Susan's fault. She started it. So here, now it is a donut. <laughs> all right. So um, with this, <laughs> Bubble Wrap says that that looks delicious. What I neglected to do was I neglected to create shadow on this side. Check this out now. Now you want to pick up this donut and eat it, right? Some more shadow here. There you go. Oh, I did not make this part of the donut in shadow. There. <laughs> so now we have a donut. Okay. So <laughs> Bubble Rapper says that should be your next t-shirt. So it's going to actually, this little donut is going to die in a few minutes when I close this program. <laughs> Boot says, don't you sit on medical donuts? Yeah, so some folks need, uh, unfortunately, donuts. Okay, <clears throat> so I think I have earned enough coffees for today. <laughs> <laughs> Ricard. Richard says Duncan Donut is Duncan Donut, yes. America runs on Duncan. <laughs> Nipa says shadows did the trick. Yes. It's all about values in, in painting and drawings. The most important thing is shadows and values. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you for hanging out with me for so long and having discussions and talking and um, discussing and asking questions. Uh, if you like this work, please support this. There are three links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal or you can be a patron. And those who are patrons and who are supporting, thank you so much. Those in general who are supporting, thank you very much for that as well. <laughs> I, I would like to NFT that. Sure. So I should save it. It's millions of dollars here. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day.